Welcome to Sunday Night Live, and this is a recorded program, so we will not have any phone calls in from our TV audience, but I'm sure you're going to find the program very interesting, because I'm here with a great friend of mine, someone known to EWTN, Father Robert Fox. Welcome, Father Robert. Thank you, Father. And as you probably know, most of you may know, Father Fox is one of the great apostles of devotion to Our Lady, especially Our Lady of Fatima, and he's the founder of the Fatima Family Apostolate, which is now about 24 years old. And uh, I asked Father Fox to come on our network because I would like to have someone right in the center of Marian devotion and of Catholic devotion to speak to people. Now, I know that many of our audience are not Catholics. Some are Orthodox, very close, but many are Protestant or Jewish or other faiths, and they're interested in it, in our work. So we want you to know why we have a devotion to Our Lady, and particularly with the unique title of Fatima which confuses people because Fatima was the daughter of Mohammed. And you should know that many Muslims, most Muslims, have a real devotion to the mother of Christ. So, Father, you've been doing this 24 years, and you're a priest of the Diocese of... Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But for a long time, you've been working internationally. Uh, yes, I used to write for the National Catholic Register, our Sunday visitor. And you've been all over the place with the apostolate. Well, yes. The last five years, I'm right at Hansville. I offer Mass daily at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. Sacrament yes. In the lower church, I call it my underground church. <laughs> <laughs> and he's down the street from Mother Angelica. That's, that's Hansville. Yes. And uh, Father, as I mentioned, a number of our audience, including some Catholics, aren't particularly well informed on what do we mean when we speak about devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. Now, some of you are well informed, but let's, let's get some facts out for the uninformed. Well, we're talking about the Mother of God, the Mother of, of Jesus, and in 1917, she appeared to the three little shepherds um, and uh, at Fatima. And it's got its name because um, a prince from Orain, who was a, a good Catholic young man, married a Muslim. And she eventually became a Catholic. And they loved her so much. Uh, when, when she died, they named this little village which is not known as Fatima, and Our Lady appeared near Fatima, so it's the Mother of God under the title of Our Lady of Fatima. Uh, that was 1917, and there obviously were several apparitions, and you have written on this extensively. Your most recent book, I think, was reviewed here on the network, which is Fatima... Fatima. It's forever. forever, yes. And uh, that's available through the network. Yes. And uh, it's very, very interesting to know that entire account. One of the things about the apparitions at Fatima is that something occurred which is very rare. It's called a theophany. That is a manifestation 
of the divine presence to everyone in a situation, independent of whether they believe or don't believe. It's there in the material world. And uh, there were about how many people at Fatima that day? Well, they, they, uh, they d debate that. Uh, it, we know it was tens of thousands. Some estimates go as much as a uh, hundred thousand, and it was seen for 35 miles or right. around what they call the miracle of the sun. What, what, why don't you describe it for our audience? Uh, first of all, the fact that a miracle was going to take place. Lucia, uh, the, the Carmelite nun that just died, uh, short, about the same time the Pope, Pope John Paul II did, please perform a miracle so people can believe you are really appearing to us. So months in advance, she tells him, at 12 noon, October 13th, I will perform a miracle so that all may believe. And of course, it had rained all night before. People were standing in water and mud. And uh, it came 12 o'clock on the, their watches, their clocks, nothing happened. Came 1 o'clock, nothing happened. There were agnostics, atheists from the Lisbon major newspapers were there to ridicule this as a hoax of the church to get people to believe. At one o'clock, nothing happened. When, because Portugal was on wartime, Our Lady is Our Lady of Peace. When it was exactly 12 o'clock true sun time overhead, like turning off a faucet, it stopped raining. The clouds swung back from east to west in moments. The sun came out, and then the sun began to uh, spin like a giant cat in a wheel, zigzag like this, uh, coming down at them. They thought the end of the world had come. Uh, they, they, uh, some people cried out uh, their, their, their sins, and uh, three, three phases. Returns to appearing to return to its orbit, and then goes through the whole thing again. And when all this went on for at least 10 minutes, uh, and when it was over with, where it had rained all morning, all night, the people's clothing, the ground, everything was dry. And uh, even the Lisbon paper, papers, O Mundo, O Seculo, actually had photographs they had to admit the truth, that this is what happened. And uh, I have met people, talked to people who were present. One lady I remember who, 20 feet from the, the little children at the time of the miracle of the sun. And uh, the sun appeared to whirl, come down close, and there were different colors Yes, of different the rays colors flashing out, from coloring the, the landscape. The I remember one time when I was speaking in Detroit, I said, uh, of course we know it was not physically the sun. And I, I shook up one lady, I think she thought her faith depended upon that. And, and uh, I said, well, how could it be the sun? You know, it's, well, okay, hydrogen atomic explosions going out millions of miles. This came down so close they felt they could reach up and touch it. And it was the sun, it was the sun she kept shouting at me. I said, no, not the, not the physical sun. Th and then she says, if it wasn't the sun, what was it? And I said, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. It was, they could see it for about 35 square miles. Yes. Now, not too far from Fatima, across the English Channel, is the observatory at Greenwich yes. in London. There was no report yeah. of astronomical phenomena that day. So it was a local theophany, yeah. a manifestation of God. It proved it wasn't anything natural. That no, happened. nothing nothing natural at all. And uh, uh, the Lisbon secular anti-religious newspapers are the best possible witnesses of yes. that. Yes. And I've seen those newspapers and uh, pictures and all, and they were utterly, utterly surprised. Yeah. There was agnost agnostics and people who didn't believe in God came to faith. 
when they witnessed that? There was a lady that lived in New Rochelle whose uncle was there. He was a mason and a mocker, went, heard the news of the report of the miracle. He went absolutely to laugh, and he was so shocked. He was hospitalized for a couple of days in kind of a catatonic situation and came out of it and became a devout believer. Yeah. But it knocked him on his behind, literally, you know. Yeah. Now, the message of Our Lady of Fatima, of course, is fairly complicated. Uh, this is a private revelation. No one is required to believe it. It's not like sacred scripture. And that's important to say. And the church has its own teaching on private revelation. I wrote this up in a book called A Still Small Voice. The church is teaching on private revelations and that's available through the network. Pope Benedict the 14th wrote extensively on this. And one of the things that people forget is that a human being, a child or an adult, is a finite creature. And if it's really God or a divine thing, you have a finite creature trying to grasp and express a totally different kind of reality. So you're not getting a news report. There has to be some interpretation, some subjective element in it. Even when you and I, if we were to describe our trip over here today, we took the same trip to this studio, we would describe it slightly differently. We would remember different things. And so there is the subjective element. You're not dealing with sacred scripture. But that said, the individual testimony, what they agree on, what they may add, what may they may amplify, that does not take away from the original experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can't imagine any serious student who admits the possibility of a divine revelation d denying that to Fatima if they've studied well, you know, the It's often said that, you know, Fatima was uh, a request to say the rosary every day, meditate on the mysteries, but it's much more than that. Oh, yes. I, I, I've known the bishops of Fatima, going back four bishops, Bishop John Venancio, I asked him to summarize for me the Fatima message. He said, Fatima is reparation, 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 and especially Eucharistic reparation. When I, to her priest nephew, asked Sister Lucia, what is the most important part of the Fatima message? And she said, that's a good question. And I never thought of it before. Give me a couple of days to think about it. Two days later, she came back with, the most important part of the Fatal Message is at the Cabezo, where the angel appeared and gave them the Holy Eucharist. And uh, uh, the, the sense of the presence of God, you know, the angel appeared three times a year before uh, the, the, our Blessed Lady came. So Fatima begins and ends with the Eucharist, which we Catholics believe is the real presence of Jesus Christ. Also, this idea of reparation. I think after we have our break, I'm going to ask you to ex expand on that. Older Catholics are very familiar with the idea of reparation, literally making up to God. But it's unfortunately not a popular idea at the present time. And not only Fatima, but Lourdes, uh, other reported revelations that have not yet uh, been totally approved, like Medjugorje, which is still to receive all, uh, final approval. The message is always the same thing. Prayer and penance, 